Good morning, everybody. That was a good worship service, right? That was great. You know, quickly, um, one of my favorite things about preaching now is getting to hear Mason play the saxophone. It really adds a nice 80s vibe that's missing from modern worship music, so I really like that. I want to say thank you very much for the opportunity to come before you and preach again this morning. Um, I also want to take a moment to thank my wife. Uh, We had Valentine's Day this weekend. We had her birthday. She sacrificed a lot of time so I could come before you this morning prepared, Um, and it is a blessing to have someone in my house that really models um, a selfless lifestyle, so I thank her for that. I want you guys to know that uh, I spent a lot of time the last month in prayer over what God would have me bring to you about His holiness. The purpose of this whole series is to kind of re-examine how we see God so that we might see Him the way He wants for us to see him. And so when Mason called me a month ago and said, hey, would you mind preaching on the holiness of God? I started to stress out a little bit because this is a very difficult subject. Um, In my opinion, it's one of the most difficult subjects in all of the Bible to preach on. And the reason for that, two things. One, whenever you start talking about the holiness of God and how holy he is, it inevitably brings into focus how unholy we are and some of our problems, and some of the junk that we carry, and nobody really likes to talk about that stuff, so these aren't feel-good sermons. And then the second thing that usually happens is, well, frankly, as human beings, we can't comprehend the holiness of God and who He is. So how does somebody who can't fully comprehend the holiness of God teach the holiness of God to a bunch of people who can't comprehend it? So it wasn't difficult at all trying to prepare something like this. Um, But God gave me something. What he kind of told me was, hey, look, if you want to really examine my holiness, you can't do it by using one passage of Scripture, right? God didn't reveal himself to humanity at one time. He did it throughout the course of history, throughout the entire Scripture. So if you looked in your bulletin this morning and you saw all those verses that are there in the front, we are going to go through all of those verses this morning. So there's a lot of information. If you don't, get it all, that's fine. Just take what the Lord gives you, because maybe God's going to reveal his holiness to you, not all at one time. It maybe might be through the course of your life. So um, I just pray for your patience this morning as we go through this, and I hope that you guys can get something from it. Before we get into it, I ask that you turn with me to Psalm 99, just to kind of get our hearts centered on God and his holiness. So if you have your Bible, Psalm 99, or you can look up on the screen. Psalm 99 says, The Lord reigns. Let the peoples tremble. He is enthroned between the cherubim. Let the earth quake. The Lord is great in Zion. He is exalted above all the peoples. Let them praise your great and awe-inspiring name. He is holy. The mighty king loves justice. You've established fairness. You've administered justice and righteousness in Jacob. Exalt the Lord our God. Bow and worship at his footstool. He is holy holy. Moses and Aaron were among his priests. Samuel also was among those calling on his name. They called to the Lord and he answered them. He spoke to them in a pillar of cloud. They kept his decrees and the statutes he gave them. Lord our God, you answered them. You were a forgiving God to them, but an avenger of their sinful actions. Exalt the Lord our God, bow and worship at his holy mountain, for the Lord our God is holy. The Lord our God is holy. And before we can really get into what God's holiness is, we kind of have to define what is holiness in the biblical context, right? So if I were to ask you what is holiness, you'd probably give me a synonym for something like moral goodness, absolute righteousness. And you're absolutely right. Whenever we're talking about the holiness of God in Scripture, that is something that's always in view. God is holy. He is different than us. But in the biblical context, there's something deeper when you talk about holiness. It's to be set apart. It's to be unique. You know, it's it's different. So, for example, you know how like men and women are different, right? (laughs) Yeah, I'm going to get myself in trouble like two minutes into my sermon. So, a couple weeks ago, uh, me and my wife were hanging out with another couple from the church, Laura and David, and we went kayaking and we went fishing and we did a campfire and we were with them till like 10 o'clock at night at my in-laws house. So they leave and we leave about 10 minutes after them and we're on our way home and I look over and my wife's on her cell phone and she's got this big smile on her face and I'm like, what are you doing? She goes, texting Laura. And I'm like, we just spent six hours with these people. What are you texting this woman about? She goes, I'm just 
thanking her for spending time with us today. And I'm just so thankful to our maker for everything that he's done in bringing us together. And I'm just looking forward to many years of a beautiful friendship. And I'm like, all right, so we get home and I bring out my phone and I'm like going to text David. I'm going to be like, here, I'm going to just kind of, you know, as a joke, like, hey, David, I'm so thankful for this relationship that we have. And I look forward to many, many years of a great friendship, heart, 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 heart. And I'm like, no, I can't send that. No, I can't. That's too far, right? Can't do it. I love you, David, but that'd be going too far. So men and women are different, but God is not different like men and women are different. He is a whole nother category. The Bible describes it as he is holy other. He's something completely different than what we are. But the Bible also talks about God's holiness as something that describes his power right? It's really his defining characteristic. God is unique, he's all-powerful, and his holiness radiates out from him, all right? So if we were to use the sun as an example, the sun is great, right? The sun is powerful, it's mighty, it, it radiates its heat and its, and its life throughout the universe, right? Or throughout our solar system. And when it gets to planet Earth, it brings life. Plants grow because of it. Humans need sunlight, Right? But if we were to get in a space shuttle and we were to blast off, the closer we get to the sun, if we get too close, the power of the sun is going to consume us and destroy us. The same thing that is used for good can also destroy. And when we start to look at God's holiness in the Bible, we start to see that as mortal men kind of come into contact with the Almighty God. And the first example we have of God's holiness in Scripture is in Exodus chapter 3. And Moses is tending his flock and One of them gets loose, so he goes out to find it, and he sees this burning bush off in the distance. And it's not consumed with a fire, so he decides, I'm going to approach it and see what this thing is. And as he gets close, God tells him, Moses, stop. Because if you come too close, like my holiness is going to consume you. As a matter of fact, my holiness is so holy and I am so holy that the ground that you're standing on right now has become holy just because of its proximity to me. So take off your shoes in reverence to who I am. And so from that point, God starts to reveal his holiness to humanity. All right. And if we go to uh, Leviticus chapter 9... At your Bibles, turn to Leviticus chapter 9. We're going to start in verse 22, because that was just a glimpse of God's holiness. But God starts to reveal himself more and more to the Israelite people. So what happens is Moses goes into Egypt, and with God's help, he delivers the people of Israel. And as they come out, God gives them the Ten Commandments. He starts giving them the law, and he starts to teach them how they can have communion with him in his holiness. And so he sets up the tabernacle system right? Or what would later be the temple system. And in doing so, he he tells them how to lay everything out in it, right? How to make the ark, the lampstands, the incense altars, the robes for the priest. He does all of that, but he tells them how to establish a special place in there called the most holy of holies or the most holy place. And it's a special room where God's presence would dwell. The priest would enter it once a year to offer sacrifice, right? And if they didn't do a list of prescribed things to make themselves pure before they entered in, God would kill him. Like, this isn't a place you'd want to accidentally stumble into, right? So in Leviticus chapter 9, we see Aaron, who was Moses' right-hand man, is going to be the high priest. And he's got his sons. And they're going to be ordained to the priestly ministry. And after seven days of being in the tabernacle, they've completed their ordination. On the eighth day, they come out to inaugurate the temple ministry. All right, so we're going to pick up in Leviticus 9, verse 22. It says, Aaron lifted up his hands towards the people and blessed them. He came down after sacrificing the sin offering, the burn offering, and the fellowship offering. Moses and Aaron then entered the tent of meeting, or the tabernacle. And when they came out, they blessed the people, and the glory of the Lord appeared to all the people. Fire came down from the Lord and consumed the burnt offering and the fat portions on the altar. And when all the people saw it, they shouted and fell face down. And in verse, or chapter 10, Aaron's sons, Nadab and Abihu, each took his own fire pan and put fire in it, placed incense on it, and presented unauthorized fire before the Lord, which he had not commanded them to do. And then, came fire, then fire came down from the Lord and consumed them, and they died before the Lord. Moses said to Aaron, this is what the Lord has spoken. I will demonstrate my holiness to those who are near me, and I will reveal my glory before all the people. And Aaron remained silent. In Exodus chapter 30, verse 9, God had commanded them not to burn unauthorized fire on the incense altar. And at the very beginning of all this, God is telling them, hey, don't mess around with my holiness. 
And if we were to read a little bit further, Moses tells Aaron, hey, your sons are dead, but you're not going to mourn like we typically mourn by ripping off your clothes and letting your hair down and putting ashes on your face. If you want to cry, you can cry, but you're not doing anything else. And if you do anything else, God's going to kill you because your sons try to profane his holiness. And we're not messing around with God's holiness. Like this is the same God that we'll call the big man upstairs. All right, and I'm not judging you if you've done it. I've done it. But, and I'm all for keeping our relationship with God real, like keeping it real. But there's a line between keeping it real and being irreverent. And I think sometimes we need to come back to having a little bit of reverence for him. So immediately after this, God isn't done laying down like, hey, I'm holy and you need to take my holiness seriously. If we go down to verse 10, he starts to lay some groundwork about his holiness and how they can continue to have communion with him. He says, you must distinguish between the holy and the common, the clean and the unclean, the clean and the unclean, and teach the Israelites all the statutes that the Lord has given them through Moses. All right. So there's two types of purity that we see in Scripture. You have moral purity, and then you have ritualistic purity. All right. So to kind of use this as an example, I'll just give you an example. Moral purity. Let's say we're going to go to Walmart, right? and we get out of our car, and we walk in the store, and we grab a cart. And you're one of those people that like to live on the wild side, and you're not scared of food poisoning. So you go back to the deli, and you get a cup of like popcorn chicken, because you know I'm going to be here for two or three hours and I'm going to be shopping and I'm hungry. So you go, you get your popcorn chicken, you're walking around the store, you're eating your popcorn chicken, you're having a good time. And after about two hours, you've got $300 worth of groceries in your cart. You decide, I don't need to pay for this $2 thing, a popcorn chicken. It's a $500 billion a year company. What do they need my $2 for? So you set it down on the shelf, you go through the self-checkout, you pay for everything and you leave the store. All right? You've broken the eighth commandment. Right? You're morally impure. You broke a commandment. But now let's say you decide you're going to go to Walmart and you go inside and you grab your cart and you don't sanctify it with one of those Purewell pure wipes. Then you walk around the store, you do your grocery shopping, you go up, you pay for everything, you leave, you get out to your car, you put everything in your trunk, you just sit down in your seat and you look down at your hands and you're like, oh, that's so good. Hey, well, I washed my hands in preparation for that illustration. All right, relax. Um, I, I didn't commit a sin, right? I'm just gross. So, like, it, ritualistic impurity doesn't mean you've necessarily done anything wrong. You're just gross. And God is so holy that you can't come into his presence if you're tainted by anything else. So what we'd see here in the next six chapters, if we were to go through them in Leviticus, is God starts to lay down what will make you clean and unclean. You can touch certain animals or eat certain animals that will make you clean or unclean. Touching dead bodies will make you unclean. Skin diseases like leprosy bodily fluids like blood. Even God commands that some fabrics are unclean. He's telling Aaron again, look, you need to take my holiness seriously. And so we get to chapter 16 Leviticus and he lays down all the things that Moses has to, or, or Aaron has to do before he can come in to the Holy of Holies, how he has to wash himself and all these things. So do we start to get a picture of how holy God is and how different he is and just powerful in his holiness. And maybe for some of you, you're going, hey, look, this is the kind of the view I've had of God's holiness for my entire life, that he will rain down fire and he will destroy me the moment I do something wrong. Like, I get it. He's different than me. And you wouldn't be wrong in that, all right? For 700 years, this is the picture of God that the Israelite people had. But then we come to the time of the prophets and God starts to reveal how he's working in humanity and what he wants to do with his holiness for them. So if we get to Isaiah chapter 6, Isaiah chapter 6, we're going to start in verse 1, we're going to read down through verse 6. It says, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord seated on a high and lofty throne, and the hem of his robe filled the temple. Seraphim were standing above him, they each had six wings. With two they covered their face, and with two they covered their feet, and two they flew. And one called to another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of armies. His glory fills the whole earth. The foundations of the doors shook at the sound of their voices, and the temple was filled with smoke. Then I said, Woe is me, for I am ruined, because I am a man of unclean lips, and live among a people of unclean lips, and because my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of armies. Then one, seraph, then one of the seraphim flew to me, and in his hand was a glowing coal that he had taken from the altar with tongs. He touched my mouth with it and said, Now that this has touched your lips, your iniquity is removed. And your sin is atoned for. 
Isaiah is brought before God in this vision. And he sees these seraphim, these angelic creatures, standing before the throne of God. And they're crying out, holy, holy, holy. And as we see here before As we sit here this morning, there are angels before the throne crying out, holy, holy, holy. And when you go to bed tonight, there's going to be angels before the throne crying out, holy, holy, holy. And Isaiah finds himself in this situation and immediately he knows the rules. I know I shouldn't be here. This is wrong. And he confesses his sin to God. And God has one of the angels get a burning coal and bring it down to Isaiah and they touch his lips with it. And it says your iniquity is removed and your sin is atoned for. Your shame is removed and your sin is atoned for. But, and what we've seen so far throughout Scripture is that when something pure comes into contact with something impure, the impure thing transfers its impurity to the pure thing. If I touch a dead body, if I touch blood, if I touch an unclean animal, it transfers its impurity to me. And here for the first time in Scripture, we're seeing something a little bit different. Something that's pure touches something that's impure and transfers its purity to it. Right? It's weird. Well, it's the Bible. It does that. It gets weirder. All right. Turn to uh, Ezekiel chapter 47. Ezekiel 47. Things get a little bit more strange. Verses 1 through 9. We'll read verse 12 as well. Then he brought me back to the entrance of the temple, and there was water flowing from underneath the threshold of the temple towards the east. For the temple faced east. And the water was coming down from under the south side of the threshold of the temple, south of the altar. And remember I said the priests had to ritualistically wash themselves to be clean before they could enter. They did that on the south side of the temple. It says, Next, he brought me out by way of the north gate and led me around the outside to the outer gate that faced east. There was water trickling from the south side. As the the man went out east with a measuring line in his hand, he measured off a third of the mile. And led me through the water. It came up to my ankles. And then he measured off a third of the mile. And led me through the water. It came up to my knees. He measured off another third of a mile. And led me through the water. It came up to my waist. Again he measured off a third of the mile. And it was a river that I could not cross on foot. For the water had risen. It was deep enough to swim in. A river that could not be crossed on foot. He asked me do you see this son of man? Then he led me back to the bank of the river, and where I had returned, I saw a very large number of trees along both sides of the river bank. He said to me, this water flows out to the eastern region and goes down to the Arabah. When it enters the sea, the sea of the foul water, or the Dead Sea, the water of the sea becomes fresh. Every kind of living creature that swarms will live wherever the river flows, and there will be a huge number of fish because this water goes there. Since the water will become fresh, there will be life everywhere the river goes." All kinds of trees providing food will grow along both banks of the river. Their leaves will not wither. Their fruit will not fail. Each month they will bear fresh fruit because the water comes from the sanctuary. Their fruit will be used for food and their leaves for medicine. Awesome, right? Makes perfect sense? No? Okay. Well, all right, so what's happening here is he's having a vision, right? And as he's having this vision, he sees the temple and there's water trickling from the temple. And as it goes down, it gets deeper, ankle deep and then knee deep and then waist deep. And then it becomes so deep that you could swim in it. And everything near this river gets healing and is brought to life, right? And here we see again that God's kind of flipping it because up until this point in Scripture, you had to make yourself holy before you could enter the temple, right? You had to be pure before you could enter the temple. Now we're seeing that something different's happening. You have the temple and purity is flowing out of the temple and bringing life to everything outside of it, all right? So what does this mean? Where is this all going? Well, we don't really know. Nobody knew the full extent until a man named Jesus came, right? And immediately Jesus shows up on the scene. There's something different about him. In Mark chapter 1, verse 24, a demon comes before him and says, look, I know who you are. You're the Holy One of God. And Jesus started demonstrating his holiness by going around and cleansing people right? The whole New Testament is filled with story after story of Jesus going and touching somebody and cleansing them. In Matthew chapter 8, we have a story. So in Matthew chapter 8, verse 1, it says, when he came down from the mountain, large crowds followed him. Right away, a man with leprosy came up and knelt before him saying, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Reaching out his hand, Jesus touched him saying, I am willing, be made clean. Immediately, his leprosy was cleansed. Then Jesus told him, see that you don't tell anyone, but go, show yourself to the priest and offer the gift that Moses commanded as a testimony to him. We see a man here that's been declared unclean because of a skin condition, which means he wouldn't have been able to enter the temple, 
right? Matter of fact, nobody would even talk to this guy because he was unclean. He would have to walk around covering his mouth and shouting, unclean, unclean, everywhere that he went. And so he sees Jesus, and he comes to Jesus and says, hey, Jesus, are you willing to touch me? Because I know you can make me pure. So Jesus reaches out his hand and touches a man that hadn't been touched in forever. And immediately, as soon as he touches Jesus, he's made clean. And Jesus says, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go to the priest. What does that mean? Well, it means now he can go to the temple, right? He's been made pure. He can enter in that, that barrier that had separated him from his relationship with God has been removed through Jesus Christ, right? And in our lives, our sin, our problems, our impurities, that's what, it's a barrier between us and God. But Jesus came and he touched us so that that barrier could be removed. Just like the seraphim came and touched Isaiah's lips so he could break the barrier so that Isaiah could be in the presence of God. Jesus Christ did the same thing for us. Like I said, the whole scripture is filled with this. You go to the next chapter, right? He's on his way to heal somebody else's daughter, and there's a woman that comes, and she just touches the very edge of his robe, and immediately she's made clean. In Luke chapter 7, we see Jesus is coming into a town called Nain, and there's a funeral procession coming out the gates. And he sees this woman who's just lost her only son, and he's moved with compassion for her. So he walks up and he touches the dead thing and says, get up, and the thing gets up, right? We have the constant, he's touching it and transferring his purity to it. Jesus is the burning coal in Isaiah's vision. So we kind of know what the burning coal is. We can kind of see that with Jesus. But what is the river flowing out of the temple? What does that mean? Turn to uh, John chapter 7. John chapter 7. I'll kind of set the scene. Jesus is in Jerusalem. He's at this big festival, right? And the day before this happens, he had just told them, hey, I'm the Messiah. And the Pharisees were going to try to kill him. So in John chapter 7, this happens. Verse 37. On the last and most important day of the festival, Jesus stood up. And cried out, if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. The one who believes in me, as the scripture has said, will have streams of living water flow from deep within him. He said this about the Spirit. Those who believed in Jesus were going to receive the Spirit. For the Spirit had not yet been given because Jesus had not yet been glorified. Did you see the streams of living water there? See, what Jesus did is he came and he wanted to establish a community of believers. And when he touches you with the purifying coal that he is, he establishes you as a mini temple. All right, 1 Corinthians 6, 19 says, Don't you know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God? Notice that Jesus didn't say that he's the living water, right? So if we were to go back to John chapter 4, he's with the woman at the well. He doesn't say, I'm the living water. He says, I will give you the living water. And here in John chapter 7, he doesn't say he's the living water. He says the Spirit's the living water, and he will give you the Spirit, right? So what we're supposed to do is, as little temples, once we believe in Jesus, we're supposed to go out into the world, let the Holy Spirit flow through us, right, and bring life and refreshment and peace to anybody who's close to the bank of the Holy Spirit that's flowing out from us, right? And our resource as we do that is that living water, right? So the Greek word there, he says, You will have streams of living water flow from deep within you. The Greek word there for deep is not like ankle deep. It's ocean deep. It's not a trickle. It's not ankle deep or knee deep or waist deep. It's ocean deep. So if you're struggling with something, if you're struggling to love, if you're struggling with patience, if you're struggling with anger or self-worth or sexual purity or anything else, you can go to the waters and draw from the waters of the Holy Spirit. And then as a miniature temple of God, you can be, let the water trickle and flow from you as you go out into the world. So where's this all going? Turn with me to Revelation chapter 22. We're going to read three verses in Revelation chapter 22. We're going to go all the way to the end of the Bible to see what is God's plan for his holiness. Then he showed me the river of the water of life, clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb down the middle of the city's main street. The tree of life was on each side of the river, bearing 12 kinds of fruit, producing its fruit every month. The leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations, and there will no longer be any curse. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city, and his servants will worship him. Did you see the parallels between that and the passage in Ezekiel where it says, you know, there's going to be trees and their fruit is going to produce every month and there's going to be healing, right? What God was doing, what he did throughout the scripture, he said, hey, look, I'm holy. I'm different than you. 
but I love you and I want to have communion with you. So he set up the tabernacle system, right? But that wasn't good enough for God. He didn't want to be confined to a room and people to be restricted in how they could experience him. So he sent Jesus so that Jesus could purify us and and make us whole. But that wasn't enough for him. He wanted us to really experience him so he had his Holy Spirit that can come and live inside of us. And as we go and we let the river flow from us and touch other people and teach them about Jesus and let Jesus touch them, someday we'll stand along the banks of this river that's flowing from the throne that comes from God's holiness. So how can we experience God's holiness every day? How can we be more holy? What does this really mean to us? What are some things that we can do? So I've just got four things. If you've got your bulletin in there, you'll see four letters that spell out the word holy. Um, I have four, four things that I think maybe we can use to help us live a little bit more of a holy life. So the first thing is hesitate. Don't act out of emotion. We need to hesitate. We need to pause. We need to be purposeful in what we're doing. The Bible uses a lot of agricultural illustrations, right? So imagine a tree. Let's say it's an orange tree. All right? And if that orange tree doesn't produce orange fruit, the, fruit, the tree's useless, right? If the tree produces bad fruit and it's rotten and somebody eats it, it can hurt them. And when we react out of emotion or we just do something without thinking about it, we start to produce sour fruit. Has anybody ever ate a sour orange? Like, what good, like what good is a sour orange? What are you going to do with a sour orange? Nobody wants that. But what we can do is if we hesitate and we think through what we're doing, we can bear the fruit of the Spirit. And the Bible says the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. So what we need to do is hesitate and think, hey, are our actions, what we're doing right now, is it out of love? Are the things that I'm doing right now pursuing peace? Are they kind? Am I exercising self-control? We need to bear sweet oranges and not sour oranges. Right? The second thing is obey. We need to obey what we know God wants from you. And maybe you don't know everything that God wants from you, and that's fine. Just obey what you do know that he wants from you. And then strive to learn more about what he wants. Right? If you know something is right, do that thing. If you know something's wrong, don't do that thing. All right? And sometimes when you start talking about obedience, people want to know, like, okay, well, yeah, I get it. I should do what God wants me to do. Um, what's the secret to being obedient to God. Um, And really, the secret to obedience is obedience. Like, there's no trick to it. You have to just choose to do it, right? It's a choice that you make. You have to yield to the Spirit and obey. The third thing is live for others. Jesus said that all the commandments and desires of God can be wrapped up in two things. Love God, love other people. Right? Treat other people the way that you want to be treated. Put selfishness aside. Start putting other people before yourself. And it's counter to our culture because our culture says, hey, it's about you. It's about your dreams. It's about your desires, your wants, your stuff. But Christ called us to live holy and do something different by putting others before ourselves so that we can reach out to them and, have, and teach them how Jesus reached out to them to touch them and purify them. And the fourth thing is you need to yoke yourself to other believers. So that's another agricultural thing, right? What does it mean to yoke yourself? So back in Bible times, they would have a big chunk of wood and they would put rope on each side of the wood and they would go to their animal, their ox, and they'd put the rope on one ox and then put the other rope on the other and they would plow the dirt together so that the burden wasn't only on one of them, right? And as Christians, when we come alongside other Christians, we plow the dirt of life together. That's why I'm a big believer in life groups because you can come alongside somebody else, right? And you guys can plow the dirt or the manure of life together sometimes, right? And um, so when you do that, right, you, you get through that season in your life and then you can come along somebody else who's going through something once you've come through it and help them plow the dirt in their life, right? So those are four things I think we can do. We can live holy by hesitating, obey, living for others, and yoking ourselves to other believers, Um, If you do these four things, I think you'll have a pretty good start on kind of living the way that God wants you to live. So the Lord our God is holy. The decision before you is if you're going to let the purifying coal of Jesus Christ come and touch you and transform you and break down that barrier that's separating you from God. And maybe you've already, you're like, hey, you know what, I've already experienced Jesus, I've, I've I've had him touch me and you know, I, I'm, I know I'm made pure. I'm pure by the blood of the Lamb, and that's great. Maybe the question before you then is, are you going to allow the Holy Spirit to flow from you? Are you going to be satisfied with just a trickle of God's goodness coming from you? 
or do you want something more, something deeper? So if you don't know Jesus this morning, you know, come forward and uh, somebody can show you how to experience the touch of his love. And if you do know Jesus, maybe you need to come forward and ask the Spirit to flow from you like an ocean. Regardless, I think we need to bow before the holiness of the real God. This morning as we've been challenged by something that is not attainable in our own strength and our own efforts. It's only done through God's allowance and God's perfection and his love in us. Let's take this step. Let's take that step of saying, yes, Lord, you are holy and I am not. And I bow before you and I give my life for you. You know, Roy has given us a challenge today, a holy challenge. And wherever you are in that step, maybe there is not a place of you saying, mm, I come to church. In and of itself is, is not easy for me, especially on a beautiful day like today, <laughs> right? But to be here is a choice that you've made. Now take that choice that you're here and say, okay, God, I want to then move into that embrace that only you can give and you touch me so that all that stuff, the manure even, is cleansed. And so this morning as we have a chance to sing as the praise team leads us, let us step into the holiness of God. Let us allow him to transform us. It will it will not be a decision that you regret. Regret. His holiness never lets us down. Amen? Let's bow. Lord Jesus, we need you. Just like the coal that touched the lips, just like the river that flowed from the temple, Lord Jesus, we need you. And Lord, we've been doing this in our own strength, in our own efforts, in our own ways for far too long. And this morning, as we've get, been given a fullness of the picture of your holiness through a walk through Scripture, your holy word, and now your Holy Spirit is speaking into our lives to say, yes, I'm yours. Let us then choose to say I'm not ashamed. I'm not ashamed to step into Christ and to be who he desires me to be and fills me to fulfill in others. We love you, Lord. We thank you. And Lord, as we choose to take a next step, whether that's coming forward and just bowing before you here at the, the platform, whether that is going to the back of the room to our next steps table and just saying, you know what? I want to take that next step of being baptized, or I want to take that next step of walking in faith with a church family, with brothers and sisters in Christ that we say, this is my home. We want to reach this community for Christ and his glory. Whatever those next steps are, choose to say yes, because God is holy. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together and sing.
Church, thank you so much for being with us this morning. And I don't know about you, allowing the Holy Spirit to step into a place of using the church like he used Roy this morning, isn't that encouraging? Isn't that something that, that, that kind of wells up in you and says, come on, let's go, you know? And as, as he has spent the last several weeks really polishing and allowing the Holy Spirit to move through this, you know, I really believe that there's something that we can do as well. And that is, there's several people in our church, and Roy being one of them, that they are asking God to open the doors of a job for them. And that's not something that, you know, especially for men, that's not an easy place of waiting, (laughs) of being patient. And so, and I know there's several of us in this room as well that are going through that same path. If you don't mind, throughout this week, as God has given you, some of us retired, some of us in the midst of a career, some of us in transition, whatever that case might be, I really believe that we are called to be like he challenged us with this morning, how the, the river flows out of the temple, we being the temple of the Holy Spirit, we then get to bring healing on people's lives. 
can you pray healing over Roy? Can you pray healing over, there are several people in our church that are looking for jobs right now that God can then use them in those places to reach people for Christ? Do you agree with that? Amen. I do. And so move in and throughout this week and allowing a next step, whether it's to go back to the back and talk with Miss Cindy about those next steps for Anastasia Church Elkton, but you can even, every step, every breath that you take this week, be listening to the Holy Spirit and saying, how can I allow the healing waters to flow from me and even pray for those that are asking God to do big things? Amen? So thank you again for coming. This week, whether it's the work to worship simulcast out of the island, whether it is in your neighborhood, whether it's in your workplace, wherever it is, be the temple of the Holy Spirit. Let his living water flow through you and let it all be for the name of Jesus. Amen. God bless you all. Have a wonderful week.